Buddy, a round of applause. Yes. Good morning, church. Uh, Jeremy forgot an announcement that we are um, going to be posting, uh, as of now, a, a youth pastor position. <laughs> so if you guys know anybody, it, literally anybody, <laughs> I hope you guys are doing well. I'm just messing with Jeremy. Hey, how many of you guys have had a real bad boss? I'm intentionally not looking toward the staff. That's why, if you're wondering why I'm looking over here, that's why. I think we've all had bad bosses, people who are just terrible at their jobs, people who don't deserve their position, people uh, whose position sort of demands our respect, but whose person doesn't demand our honor. Anyone else thinking about me? Oh, see, now you don't want to put your hands down real fast. Hard bosses are hard to have. People in authority over us uh, whom we need to submit to is, uh, is just a part of life. It's a hard part of life. One of my favorite things are bumper stickers. Uh, most of you guys who are new to North Idaho, so most of you guys, um, an old Idaho cultural thing is we didn't used to have a whole lot of bumper stickers. And that's sort of changed over the last decade or so. I think people are real, real neat who feel like they need to show every form of opinion that they hold dear to them on the back of their vehicle. Like, like it's impressive, or maybe we can get to know one another while I'm honking at you to not stop too long at the stop sign. Whatever motivates y'all to put bumper stickers on, uh, I think it's just real cute. And one of the things that I think are um, among the cutest of bumper stickers are in any given term of any U.S. presidency, there will be a small fraction or a larger fraction in North Idaho of people who say, X is not my president. Those crack me up. Those crack me up. Like a bumper sticker can make reality occur is, is just a real neat thing that we think we can do. We as people, we especially as Americans, I dare say, in particularly North Idahoans, are real, real, real good at not liking people to have authority over us. Can I get an amen? amen? I don't ask for a lot of amens, but I feel like if anything I say can get an amen, that is it. Well, today you get to hear me talk about why you should respect church authority. How fun is that for all of us? That's real neat. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Hebrews chapter 13. We're going to start at verse 7, or if you have authority issues, doors are right there. And so, we're just going to dive in. Hebrews 13, I'm feeling real spicy. I've got short time coming up, short term, and uh, just letting it all out more than usual. You thought that there was, there was no more. You thought we were at the limit. Boy, were you wrong. Are you guys ready? So the first verse goes something like this. Remember your leaders. Those who spoke to you the word of God, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Kind of a doozy. We've spent Hebrews, the largest part, 10 and a half chapters, were about truth, mostly about Jesus, what we ought to believe, kind of the whys, and then the last chunk of Hebrews, which obviously we're close to wrapping up, is about the so what, like how do we live this out? And so last week we kind of ended on the fact that we uh, should live a certain way, and then all of that was backed up by quoting Psalm 118, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear, what can man do to me? And so the author had left us as we broke through this passage of scripture last week of reminding us who God is, our security in him, like the song we just sang, uh, we know who we are because we know who he is. But, but with that foundational truth set, the author then moves to how we relate to other human beings. The author kind of broaches a subject that obviously within any group of humans, whether it is official or not, or with any organization, especially the living church, that there simply needs to be leadership. This is an anarchy. We, we need to have unification. We need to understand the boundaries of who we are, what we believe, what we don't, where we're aiming toward. And so the book here now moves toward leadership. Even though God ultimately is the authority of all people in all the earth, at all times, specifically now, though the word here is leaders, uh, this generally is just speaking to the people who lead you. The Bible talks about several different types of leaders. Uh, there's the term pastor, which in the original Greek is just shepherd, uh, quite literally like a shepherd, someone who takes care of livestock. It is not a very well-defined word. Uh, there are better defined words for leadership in the New Testament, particularly in 1 Timothy 3 and also in Titus that talks specifically about elders and deacons. If you read through the New Testament, you will find that uh, the most um, 
the clearest way to form a church with high fidelity to Scripture is that elders need to be in charge of every church. We are one of those churches. We are an elder-led church. That is where the authority of this church lies. Uh, there is a group of men that we believe God has called and gifted, men who we have identified were already doing the work of eldering, who are exhibiting that calling and those giftings, and then have been asked to be on our elder board. The elders are a group of men who pray, who seek the Lord's vision for this church, who set doctrine, who guard us from uh, either staff or other members or outsiders who might be misbehaving. Uh, the men do a lot, and you will see almost none of it because most of it is behind the scenes. They're my bosses. Uh, I do sit on the elder board, but they tell me what to do. They have absolutely every right to hire or fire me or any other pastor. And so when this author here is talking about our leaders, uh, it can be just in general anyone who has leadership over you, but obviously within the context of Scripture, we're talking about the leaders of the church. And so the first command, the first uh, exhortation, if command feels a little sharp for you, is to remember them. This word remember uh, in the original Greek doesn't mean like you have utterly forgotten and it's time to conjure up a long lost memory. Rather, this is just bringing to mind something that we all already know. You might need to remember your address if you're going to tell people so that they can enter it into their map app, but it's not as if you have forgotten where you live. This is that same type of remembering. The author is now saying, just let us now, with the forefront of our minds, point our attention to the leadership of our church, to those who spoke to you the word of God. The word leader here is a verb that simply means to lead. This is a very generic idea of leadership, but it is more specifically boiled down uh, when it is um, explained as thus those who spoke the word of God to you. And so the author here is talking about all leadership in the church. This uh, could include, but doesn't only include the elders. Not, it doesn't even mostly include me. These are just people in our church or in your life who have shared the word of God with you. And so now we're to think of them and to consider the outcome of the way of their lives. This now is a consideration, a stopping and thinking, how are they living? Are they setting a good example or a bad? What can I learn from them? What parts of their life may I emulate or what should I stay away from? We're to remember them and next move on toward considering the outcome of the way of life. Lives have a trajectory, a track. If you get to know someone um, even kind of well for even a small amount of time, you can generally get a feel for where their life is heading what means most to them, what, what they're investing into, what the goal or the aim of their life and their mission is. And this now is saying for the leaders, those spiritually who are pouring into your life, who are speaking this word of God, think through this. Think about what they're living for. Use them as an example if you're ever wondering what you might need to do in your life or, or what the next step of faith could be. Uh, if you don't want to explicitly ask, why not just consider their ways of life and think about the outcomes that you see playing out. Finally, if you can find good leaders who are Christ-like, who are not hypocrites, who say a good message but live a destructive one, the ultimate thing that we can now do is to imitate or mimic their faith. And so this is a fascinating passage. This obviously rubs against the grain of proud, independent North Idahoans. This now is saying within the context of the church, you can play American politics as much as you want. Please be self-sufficient and learn to do your own stuff. That's fantastic. But in the context of the church, scripturally speaking, you're, just, you're not alone ever. That's not the point of Jesus. That isn't the picture of the church or the New Testament gospel. It is always people together, a people of faith moving forward in the direction that God has called them. And so as we do this, we need to recognize that this can be done, hopefully, by God's grace really well, but realistically, most of us have seen this play out really, really poorly. And so it is obviously just pretty uh, real to admit that so often this goes wrong. This is one of the reasons that I think it is so important to make sure that the people that we submit to, the churches that we go to, the leaders to which we look up, that they are real, that they're true, that there's authenticity in their faith. Don't be foolish enough to expect perfection. Uh, if you thought this was a perfect church, it's not because you're here. <laughs> it's not because I'm here. And we need to recognize we, we are flawed, that there are still human beings leading this church. Uh, as much as I love our elders, as godly as they are, and I can vouch for the sincerity of their faith, we're men, we're flawed, uh, we need help. This is one of the reasons that could make a good leader. 
is that people who want to lead for Jesus uh, need to recognize that ultimately the, the view of a church uh, isn't like a power structure. It's not as if this is a multi-tier marketing scheme, but it's the opposite. If you want to view authority and leadership in the church based on Jesus and his leadership and the words that he spoke, if there is any form of flow structure or, or hierarchy, it's, it's inverted. Think of an upside-down triangle or pyramid if you're more three-dimensional. Jesus is at the bottom. It is Jesus who built his church. Jesus is the head of this church and all others. This church uh, is for him and through him and by him and ultimately unto him. And so we need to recognize that, that Jesus holds all things together as the book of Hebrews began. And if you want to find greatness or leadership or authority within the church, uh, you need to recognize to do it the way of Christ is actually to work your way down, to become less and less, to give up more and more of your rights and privileges. That the higher up in church leadership you think you can get, the more you realize it's not about you. It's not you fighting for your way. It's, it's you giving up your way, abdicating your will, and getting on your knees and seeking what God wants for this church or any other church. This can play out in the elder board. This can play out in your family. This can play out in your relationship. This can play out in your growth group and in many, many other ways. This author here is saying if, if we recognize that the kingdom of God is right side up and this whole world has gone upside down, that we won't play the power structures of this world, that, that the church isn't the newest corporation, that this isn't an organization built on a person or a person's will, but, but rather we exist by Jesus and through Jesus and for Jesus. This is why we always say that we are a church that is all about Jesus. Jesus in Matthew 20, verses 25 through 28 said, uh, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles, they lord it over them. They're on top and everybody else is beneath them. And their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so scripture is really clear. Churches need leadership. There will always be someone or some ones that provide that, who set the tone, uh, but ultimately, if you're looking for a healthy church and, and a spiritually safe place to live and grow and invest, uh, it is up to you to recognize what is healthy and unhealthy types of leadership. Look to Jesus. Look to the way that he lived. Look explicitly to the words in Matthew chapter 20 and see the leaders in your life. Are they hypocrites or do they love Jesus? You can't demand perfection, but you can certainly demand humility and godliness. Does the church exhibit uh, an unfettered lust for power and authority and greatness in the world's terms, or is it actually a church uh, by the grace of God who literally wants to change and save the world? We want that to be us at Anthem, and, and so it is, so, it is uh, weird and challenging uh, and, and really... Um, penetrating to encourage you to think that of me and others. Would you remember us? I give you permission. I live in a fishbowl. Examine my ways of life. Do I treat you as you should be treated? Am I serving you as Christ would serve you? Do our elders exhibit an, a, a wanton will for more, or do they, uh, do they exhibit this servant-like attitude of Christ? If we can live up to what Jesus has called us toward, the scripture says, would you be willing to imitate our way of life? See, the funny thing is, is that everyone in some form or another, in one context or another, is a leader. You all lead people in one way or another. Maybe it's not officially, but, but maybe it's on the playground. Maybe it is in the classroom. Maybe it's simply in your family. Any, any parent is a leader. Any older sibling is a leader. Anyone who is better than others at sports or arts or whatever it is, whenever you're in a position that people aspire to be you or look up to you or admire what you have or are, that's leadership. And the gospel now is saying, would you use that, now flipping our perspective, you as a leader, would you use what God has given you, where he has gifted you in, the positions he has placed you in, whether asked for or not, and would you leverage those to point people towards Jesus? One way or the other, you will be teaching them, you will be influencing them, you will be affecting them, and will it be toward righteousness, or will you just be one other worldly person who lords over, who rules over, who, who uses what you've been given to make yourself great at the expense of all others? 
These are very, very convicting words. The author moves now, and I'm still having a hard time tracking with kind of the flow of logic, but the the author moves on and says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if you want to sound like a real stuffy Christian, just throw out the term immutability. When you're talking about God's unchangeableness, people will be so impressed with you, and you could lord it over them. Perfect opportunity to do exactly what I'm telling you not to do, if you want to. Immutability. And so the author now moves to Jesus. Moving back away from humans who can be flawed, who can let us down and probably will, and back again to the gold standard. Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. He's unchanging. He won't contradict himself. He can't be faithful one day and and become flawed another. He can't wield authority well for a period of life and be seduced by the power and go astray on some other decade of his life story. Though humans do, Jesus doesn't. And so always back everything up with Jesus. And now the author moves towards what can go wrong in church, how leaders often do use church people, abuse church authority to get their own gain. And so the author now is is referencing something that feels pretty specific without enough specifics to give us an idea of what's actually being talked about. But the author says, do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings. So those ideas of diverse and strange, diverse literally means many colored, varied, variegated, if you like odd words, and strange, uh, often translated as alien. Uh, It's an interesting word because it actually demands a relationship between one and another, and there's a, a great deal of difference between the two. And so the author is saying there's continually gonna be an array of teaching that claims to be of Christ. There will always be an endless supply of teachers with a new vision, with a great new way to look at Scripture. There will be teachings that seem strange. They're alien. They're new. They're foreign. Uh, They might sound really seductive to us. They might tell us what we want to hear. They might omit some of the most offensive parts of Scripture. And what this author is saying is do not be led away by those. That word led away means uh, close up. It's a compound Greek word, close up and carried. This is a close relational connection. Don't don't let your heart be won by strange teachings. Don't become religiously enamored with things that probably aren't actually found explicitly in Scripture. Don't let people tell you that these minor scriptural things are actually the most important things about your religion. Don't be led away by these things. For it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace. The bedrock of our relationship with Jesus, the firm foundation that we have as believers who have been saved by our faith, is that it is nothing that we can do. That is literally what the word grace means, undeserved favor, someone treating you better than you deserve. And so this author points us back to the bedrock of the truth of Scripture, that we need to rest on the grace of Christ Jesus. You can't earn your salvation. You can't pay off your salvation. You right now, no matter what God has done in your life, are no more deserving of salvation than literally the worst person on earth. We can't elevate ourselves. We can't be puffed up with pride. If we know the truth of Scripture and are living according to it, we need to recognize it is grace, grace, grace. From the beginning to the end, grace carries us through. So often, a seductive lie within the church is we really do deserve this. We really were better qualified to receive Jesus. We would steward this better than those poor, unsaved people of the world. And so we become judgmental instead of loving. We become inclusive rather than going out to the least of these and sharing the love of Christ with them. When we lose grace, church, we lose everything. And so the author is moving us back to this. Let your heart be strengthened by grace. And now, again, it moves to something that seems a little weird, not by foods, which have not benefited those devoted to them. Whatever was going on, it seems like it was a bunch of rules and regulations. It was about doing this or not doing that, that you somehow gained control of how righteous you were based on what you did or did not do. Apparently, it revolved around foods, but oftentimes, things like this manifest in the church. Well, if you were really wanting to be a good Christian, you would live this way, or you would abstain from these things, or you would vote this way, or you would spend your money in these forms of ways, or you wouldn't do this idea of entertainment or allow it, or you would, you would raise your children this way, or speak to your spouse this way. There will always be teachings that make you feel in control. These are the strange and varied teachings that inflame the wickedness within us, that, that we always are wanting to be in control, 
to earn, to pay off, to deserve, to elevate ourselves, to lord whatever we have over others. Right now, the author is talking about foods, but we do it in a multitude of ways within the church. The author moves us back. Rather than doing what you feel like you can do, rest on the grace of Christ Jesus and allow your heart to be strengthened through that. Now the author moves to even more uh, kind of archaic and hard to penetrate imagery. And they say, we have an altar which those who serve in the tent, referring to the temple's predecessor, the tabernacle. So we have an altar. This altar uh, used to be literally this little table covered with gold where the sacrificial animals were killed and sometimes burned upon. It was sort of the epicenter of worship, of dealing with sins through sacrifice. Like this was a holy place where the work of people meeting their God and God forgiving people's sins, literally the epicenter of that, was on this altar for most occasions. And so now this author, using our our archaic language that most of us don't really readily understand, says, we have a place to deal with sin. We have a place to meet God. We have a place to offer blessings and sacrifices unto him. We, We have a location to go to for a cleansing of conscience and an interaction with the living God. This altar doesn't happen to be in a movable tabernacle. This altar isn't in a location on the hilltop of Jerusalem where the temple once stood. We have this altar that isn't in that tent, and those people who adhere to laws, who live according to the old covenant, they have no right to the privileges that we now have through Christ. For the bodies of those animals, again referring to these old sacrificial system animals that were killed for sins, For the bodies of those animals whose blood was brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin, they are burned outside of the camp. This is a very, very specific sacrifice that is being referred to here. It's um, referring again, using imagery that Hebrews has already used about this day of atonement, the highest, holiest day of the year for people who would live under the law, for the Hebrews who adhere to Judaism. It was a day often referred to as a day of affliction, A day where people would intentionally think through the sinful nature of themselves. That any sin that they committed throughout the year was immediately dealt with through sacrifice. But then at the end of the year, or rather the beginning of the year, this day of atonement, the people had to admit we are so sinful that even though we've tried to deal with our sin, we've got to admit that we sin so much we forget about it, we can't keep track of it, we often sin unintentionally and are unaware of it, and yet God knows. And so this day of atonement, the specific sacrifice, had a specific set of regulations. Rather than being sacrificed within this holy place of the temple, it was taken outside of even the walls of Jerusalem as an idea of, let's get this out of here. We can't deal with this. This is too much for us. We are leaving this to God. Using this imagery about these sacrifices burned outside of the camp, the author now moves to Jesus, the sacrifice of all time. So Jesus also suffered outside of the gate, referring quite literally to Jesus being crucified outside the city walls of Jerusalem on Golgotha. And he says, continuing on with them, that he was suffered outside of the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. So Jesus literally died outside of the gate, but in a more metaphorical sense, in a figurative way, what the author is saying is uh, Jesus came. The word of God became flesh and dwelled among us, and we have seen his glory and the glory of the one and only begotten of the Father. John wrote this decades after Jesus' resurrection. But we know that the story is that even Jesus' own people to whom he came, they didn't recognize him as the Son of God. They rejected him as the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior. They wanted nothing to do with him. And even when he died, as prophesied by Isaiah, they celebrated. They thought it was God's punishment upon a heretic. And so in in a literal and figurative sense, uh, Jesus was well outside the bounds of the holy places, well outside the bounds of what the minds and the hearts of the people were willing to accept. He was rejected. They, They didn't understand who he was. They refused to acknowledge the glory of the one and only. When we recognize what happened to Jesus, the author says this in verse 13, therefore, in light of this, because now that we are remembering and recalling Jesus, the ultimate leader in the church, let's go to him. Let's move toward that place, the place of hardship and rejection, a place of friendship with God rather than friendship with this world. Let us go to him outside the camp and let us bear the reproach that Jesus endured. These are admirable Christian words and these are excruciating real life words to live out. 
What the author here is saying is uh, you've got two choices. You've got a life in this world and you can be productive and fruitful and you can be accepted and your life can be easy and you can go with the flow and you can be culturally acceptable and you can probably make a pretty good living at all of it. But you're gonna be inside the camp. You're gonna be with the world. You, you won't make your way on that hard, narrow path toward Jesus. But if you are willing to walk the hard road, to find that narrow path, to do what it takes to be with Jesus, uh, the world will, will cut grains against you. And like Jesus, you will be rejected, misunderstood, sometimes intentionally so. You will be mistreated, but you'll be with Jesus. Let us bear the reproach he endured. For here, we have no lasting city, but we seek a city that is to come. That word city in the original Greek doesn't necessarily mean city. Uh, Most of us are pretty urban loving people. Rather, it said we have a forest, we have a mountain glade, but rather it says city. But really what it's meaning is that we have a dwelling place, we have a place to belong, we have a hometown, and it's not in North Idaho. And we have a citizenship, and it's secure, and it's not because you carry a U.S. passport. And we have a place that we long for and that we feel as home, and it's not the United States of America. We have a place that we want to grow old and and become fertile, and that we want to be all that we were made to be. And it's not on this physical world. The author is reminding us, you are made for more. You are destined for better. You were purchased to have a citizenship elsewhere. It is important to participate in this world. We are called as believers to live for the blessing of our community and our nation and our world. We have a role to play here and now in a real, tangible, physical way. But we need to also understand that if we are to be found with Jesus, that this world can't contain us, this world can't identify us or confine us or tell us who we are or what we can believe. If we can believe all of this, The author has a really heavy-hitting verse in verse 15, and it says this. Through him, as a reminder, it all goes back to Jesus. You might be inspired. You might be encouraged. uh, You might be tempted to go run out and do all of this on your own. And the author says, whoa, none of this is possible with your own strength, on your own intellect. You can't do this through willpower or through your intrinsic goodness. This is only through him from the beginning to the end. And so if we can continue to walk with Jesus, let us continually offer up a sacrifice. This word continually is fascinating. I'm so often convicted as a follower of Jesus uh, how fickle, how... um, have you, ever, like, have you ever walked by a light, particularly fluorescent light, because they're the worst, and they're like buzzing, and you can, see the, you can hear the buzz and see the light flicker? I feel like that's our worship as Christians. Like we're on and off. Some of us are a lot more off than on. When we do worship, we're not worshiping as brightly as we ought to. And I'm convicted as a follower of Christ that more and more of my life should be more and more worshipful, all directed toward him. Anthem is the name of our church, and anthem is a song of praise or celebration. We are named this way because we want our lives to be songs of worship and celebration to Jesus. And we argue continually that people were created to worship. This is literally what you do. Fluorescent lights turn on, they provide light. You as human beings created in the image of God were created as worshipers. There's no switch for this, it's stuck on. You right now and throughout this last week have perpetually been worshiping and it doesn't necessarily have to be God. Whatever you're fixated on, thinking about, lusting toward, imagining, investing in, spending time on, whatever that is that has become most important in any moment, that is your form of worship. That is your anthem at any given time. And we are continually pushed back in Scripture, specifically here, commanded and encouraged because of Jesus and through Jesus, let's double down. Let us utilize the intrinsic thing that we are created to do and let us point that worship toward Jesus. Let us glorify him, not money or your way of life or your health or your safety or your family or education or any number of things that we can inadvertently or intentionally worship, but rather continually let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God. Scripture is unapologetic, but it's also really real that this isn't easy oftentimes. This isn't flippant. This isn't free for us, that it comes at a sacrifice. Have you ever uh, in motivated by love, have you ever tried to give a gift to someone and you want it to be meaningful, but you give a gift that's utterly free, it costs you no money and no time? 
Uh, if you're horrible enough to do that to someone you love, uh, I'm guessing that they didn't receive that well. If you think about your own life, the best gifts you've ever received and the people that gave them to you. Uh, if you're anything like me, the gifts carried weight because they either cost the people I love a lot of resources or a lot of their time, a lot of their attention. Gifts, love poured out in ways that are meaningful come at a high price. This is how we share love with one another. And now the author is moving this toward God. Do you recognize that if you're actually worshiping the creator of the cosmos, the person who knows you on an atomic level, the one who holds all authority on heaven and on earth, do you think he is satisfied or honored or glorified by flippant, half-hearted praise every now and then when it's the most convenient in your life? Is that a sacrifice of praise at all? And so the author encourages us to recognize this ought to be and can be and should be costly, and they were encouraged to make it continually. Specifically, the sacrifice of praise, if you're curious uh, how to define that better, is, is here defined. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his, Jesus' name. Oftentimes, especially men, and I, know I get, knock your heads a lot on this, I hear a lot of, I just hate worshiping. I don't like singing. Where else in my life am I going to get together in a big building and worship a bunch of people by singing aloud? Uh, nowhere. There you go. You got it. But what else could compare to worshiping the living God? And I understand that not a lot of us are touchy-feely, highly emotional. We're not a highly emotional church. That's, that's okay. But, but worshiping God should carry emotion, and it ought to be motivated with passion. And if you're not into the corporate worship times, uh, here is something down and dirty, nitty-gritty, real life. If you're not into raising your hands and singing songs, number one, I promise you God will get you there at some point or another if you love him. But if you're not now, uh, be man enough or woman enough to proclaim his name in work, at school, wherever you find yourself with your friends you know who aren't believers, at family gatherings when you know people might live and think differently than you. There are many, many ways to praise and worship our God. One of the best is corporately through worship, but it's certainly not the only and so the author now says, if you really want to put your money where your mouth is, start celebrating Jesus, speaking his truth, sharing his love, having lips that acknowledge his name. And again, if you're anything like me, the things that pass through our lips in any given week were probably not fit under that umbrella of things that glorify and acknowledge the name of Jesus. It's incredibly convicting that our lips matter. The words we speak are important. They carry weight. Any opportunity lost to communicate Jesus is heartbreaking. Continuing on, as if we weren't convicted enough, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such are the sacrifices, and they are pleasing to God. Again, if, if this is just not your cup of tea for worship, go give your stuff away. Find someone to help out. If you think spiritually between your God and you, assuming you're saved, uh, we know that we were the least deserving. We know that we were enemies. All of us can freely admit it is only because of the grace of Christ that we are saved. He is so lavish, so generous toward us, so much of the goodness that God has given us is squandered. But then when we have a very small amount of resources, man, are we demanding. They need to deserve it, and they need to earn it, and I'm going to question whether or not they're even good enough for my time or my resources. The author here, with a double negative, is saying, don't not do good. That's not an option, but rather share what you have, because God views this as a sacrifice. And when you do things that are hard, that disconnect the tethers from your heart to this world, things that you do that divest from this world rather than holding on to it with a death grip, God is pleased by your attitude and by your actions. Continuing on and wrapping up, the author says, obey your leaders and submit to them. You guys were thrilled to hear that, huh? Super cool. And again, within this context, having leaders that lead you to Jesus, you have authority, you have discernment, you're not stuck here. You need to recognize that, that there is interplay between authority and leadership and everyone else. All the authority, all the leadership in this church is really from Jesus, Anyone who leads in this church is part of this church, just like you guys, and that way it's a very democratic form of leadership. But you need to recognize that it's up to you to suss out whether there's sin in the camp or not, whether there's hypocrisy in leadership or not. To check your own heart, are you here because you think that, that we're successful enough for you to participate in, or because you can encounter the living God here? 
when you find a healthy place that is free from those strange teachings, then invest and obey and submit. Ultimately, the author is saying, plug in. Don't, don't just be here for a year or three months and then check out the next latest church. Don't just sit here unwilling to invest because you're just waiting for someone to offend you so you can move on as you always do. If you're to obey and submit, this is long-term and this is relational and this is real. Church asks for a lot when we do church the way Scripture says. And also recognize this, that leaders, this horrifies me, just as a disclaimer, they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. So, got that going for me as a pastor. Uh, The elders bring this up often. We uh, don't elder because... uh, We need to politic. We don't elder because we have literally nothing better to do. Uh, We elder, hopefully, because we're called and we know that it is pleasing to God. We elder also because we recognize this isn't ours. This isn't our church. These aren't our decisions. We're not seeking our own will. This is why our elders only make decisions unanimously or we don't make decisions. We pray. We seek the will of God. There aren't voting. There isn't voting. There aren't a majority who wins and a minority who loses. This is Jesus' church. And we need to recognize it that if you somehow have a role to play with discernment and investment, so also does leadership have an answering to do between you and the living God that we have somehow led you with integrity, that we have provided you the opportunities that are demanded through Scripture, that this is important. So also, please let us do this with joy. Please don't make us grumble when we do this. Church people are sometimes some of my least favorite people in the world demanding and religious and hypocritical and having one set of standards for themselves and a whole lot of other standards from others. As pastors, we've had people discuss why it's wrong for my wife to not work in the church, public school of all things, uh, why we shouldn't drive newer cars, why we shouldn't live where we live, why we ought to homeschool our kids. People are always trying to make these demands that have nothing to do with the truth of Scripture. All of our leadership is under the gun in one form or another. It's not what we're asking you to do. We're not asking you for unsolicited advice. We're not asking you to come in here and whip up this church the way you think church ought to be. We're asking you to invest into this. This isn't ours. This is hopefully, ultimately, Jesus's. And if we're all seeking his face, if we want his will here on earth as it is in heaven, doesn't that sound like the most joyful and fertile ground to be involved in rather than a bunch of malcontents grumbling and groaning? That would be no advantage to us. And so the author closes by saying, can we do this well? Can we be a team as we seek Jesus? And ultimately now the author says, pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience. And hopefully leaders who are honoring Jesus do. I know I'm not an excellent leader. I know I make mistakes. But I know that I'm not fighting for my way. I know that I'm not here with some ulterior motive. But rather, we have this clear conscience as we want Jesus to be made known desiring to act honorably in all things. The author concludes by saying in today's passage, I urge you the more earnestly to do this in order that whoever it was might be restored to the audience. And ultimately what we see in this is a heart of love and care and compassion from a leader to the people that they are writing to. Our hope is that our leadership will demonstrate that and that those in this church will recognize that you are loved and honored and that our eldership, our pastors, our growth group leaders are under you to elevate you, to push you up, to make you better in Christ. Would you guys stand with me? Jesus, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for Jesus and his authority that he wields, that at his name, Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess ultimately that he is Lord God. God, we thank you for your grace that you have opened our eyes to our need, that you were loving enough that we could feel the conviction of our sin, and that you were good enough to save us from that sin as you died on the cross. God, would you bless Anthem Hayden to the extent that we are faithful to you? God, would you have your way with this congregation? We gladly proclaim this church is yours. Would you show us your will? Would you allow this to be the most beautiful expression of church that we can be? God, would you free us from human wills and desires? Would you continue to protect us from politics and power struggles? God, would you cleanse the camp of sin that so easily entangles us? 
God, would you allow every one of us to become leaders in one form or another, and would you help us to point in our leadership those who follow towards Christ? Ultimately, God, we worship you. God, you are worthy of our praise. Would you help me and would you help this church, Lord, to become more and more faithful worshipers of you? We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Church, we want to thank you for worshiping with us, and please go and enjoy your beautiful day. There will be some of us up front for prayer if you would like. Thanks.